Well, this morning, um, uh, as Aaron just prayed, uh, Brett Rungi is going to be sharing with us this morning. Um, I spent uh, the last week out at Weir Baptist Camp with about, um, I don't know, 300, no, I think it was nine, but either way, um, <laughs> children, and um, uh, I just, I don't want to take up his time, but just quickly, I just want to say, I was thinking about this this morning, how thankful I am that uh, a few years ago, I would be preaching this morning. I would have stayed up all night long, I would have crammed in sermon preparation, and I would have preached a terrible sermon this morning because I didn't have anybody else to call. And today, I have multiple men from our congregation that I can trust to call and say, will you fill this pulpit? And I am so thankful and so blessed that we can do that. And so, um, again, this morning, uh, Brett is going to be sharing, so I'll give Brett the stage. Thanks, Brett. Good morning. Um, I first and foremost want to thank all of you for the opportunity to be able to do this. It's one of the greatest gifts and honors that I have in life is to be able to teach and, and preach God's Word. And uh, over this last week, I've talked to several different congregants, and they were very um, encouraging and edifying and, and prepare, preparing for um, this Sunday to make everything come together beautifully and nicely. And uh, even yesterday, I was talking with my wife, Megan, about uh, I was going to preach today, getting everything ready, preparing last night, all of the final things. And in typical uh, preacher's wife fashion, she gave me some encouragement and said, don't embarrass me, I like it here. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can always count on a preacher's wife that when you're feeling really good about yourself, a piece of humble pie fresh out of the oven. So, but no, it's, it's really a, a joy to be able to be here and to share this study time for God's word. But before we get started, I'd like to pray. Will you bow your heads, please? Father, I ask that our hearts are humbled before you, that our lives revolve around you. As we sang this morning, that you tune our hearts to be in harmony with you, that you remake our hearts into ones that are obsessed and focused and, and satisfied by your love and by our calling. We have so much to be thankful for. Even when we are in the valley or whether it's on the mountaintop, your love and grace and mercy surrounds us, protects us. And I ask as we go through the passages this morning and the message that you have laid out for this church, that we are able to meet the discipline from, from your word head on, that we're able to see the opportunities that you have opened for us, but also have the courage and strength to be able to take those opportunities to strengthen your kingdom here and to protect the church that you have made us stewards over. So again, I thank you for everybody that are within the walls of church this morning and those who are unable to make it, that your name be glorified and that your praises are sung and that we are focused on living a life that is worthy of your calling. So we... We lift all these things up in your name, we lay them at your feet, and we praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so the, um, the passage that we're going to be spending, or the theme for today is uh, a growing love for God. And there's a lot of different ways. This is not by any means a rare topic in the church today. We hear sermons and books and podcasts and all kinds of things about the topic of love. And for good reason. The, one of the central tenets of the entire Bible is God's unfailing love for his people. How far that love goes. And no matter how far our sin goes, his love, grace, and mercy go that much farther so that, we're, so that we are covered and we are called into his presence. But there are aspects of love that God has placed within us that are not only misunderstood but misapplied in the church. And as we're going to see today, the reason why modern Christianity is in the, in the state that it is in, tearing itself apart at the seams, pastors burning out at, at unprecedented levels, horrible doctrine being, pla being placed above God's word, 
from coast to coast. All of this is rooted, they're simply symptoms of an issue that Christianity today has failed in. And that is understanding not only how we receive God's love, but how we love God. And so that's where we're going to be spending our time. We're going to be looking at a couple different uh, points about this idea of love. Is that Now that we have received it as believers, now we are going to see what do we need to do with it in order to maintain, strengthen, and outreach from God's church. To kind of get our feet wet, I want to open up with a couple short passages. The first one being in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you have ever been to a wedding, odds are you have probably heard this passage um, in its entirety, most likely. But we're going to be looking at only a couple of these verses. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. This is Paul writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and he is working his way through a disciplinary letter, showing them what, where they have had failures and where they can strengthen themselves and recorrect their course in repentance. One of the major um, tent poles of this book is that of love. And so in the 13th chapter, starting in verse 1, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver, my, deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And so what you see here is that within the life of the believer, within the ministries of the church, and with the beauty of the, the ministries of, of the average believer, love is paramount. He says it is the greatest gift next to Christ himself that we have received in this church. Love is where the focus should be. Love is where the application should be. And the beauty and health of a church grows directly out of our understanding and application of what love is and how to use it. And so, again, we'll use kind of this same idea. And I love the imagery that Paul uses here, saying that if you don't have love, you're just making noise. And that is something that even Jesus uh, spoke on. Let's go back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Another nice short one. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. This is the famous passage where Jesus is expounding upon the need for prayer, the, the function of prayer, the practice of prayer. And he makes something very interesting that kind of sheds light on what love truly is. And that where real love is, where real integrity is, is not when you're out in front of a bunch of people, but it's when nobody else is watching. When you're in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with another person who needs something or when you are in, uh, you're having your quiet time and you're talking to God and God alone, that is what he is talking about. That is where love flourishes and where it sets its feet and the foundation is built. And so Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward already. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now, this is not saying that it's not that we shouldn't be praying corporately as a church. It's not saying that it's not okay to pray in front of other people. But that, it, that should not be your focus because the life of the believer and the spiritual health of the believer starts with your prayer life. In the years that I was doing pastoral ministry, I could always tell how healthy a believer was 
based on their prayer life. If your prayer life is thriving and you spend time talking to God, uh, the more you do that, the more your life will be set on a solid foundation because your perspective and your, and your idea of love completely shifts. And what's interesting here about what Paul is saying is he uses a very interesting word in verse 7. It might be translated empty phrases or noisy phrases, noisy words. There's different ways to translate it in verse 7. Mine says empty phrases. And even though you have two words here in the English, it's actually one word in the Greek, and it's batalageo. And it's two words, logos, which you have heard in studies and sermons over the past few months, is the Greek word for the word or to speak. And bata is a very interesting choice for uh, Paul because that's an onomatopoeia. And if you guys remember what an onomatopoeia is, that is just a sound. It's a word that makes a sound. I always think back to like the super old Batman back in the 60s, that every time Batman would do anything, you'd have these big words pop up on screen, like boom, pow, zip, thwap, right? That's what bata is in the Greek. And so what he's literally saying is, is when your eyes and your heart are not focused on loving Christ, and your prayer does not revolve around the love of Christ, you are just making noise. It's useless words. And so it shows that not only is prayer incredibly important, but the love that motivates it is the most important thing in the life of the believer. Now, I want to say something that is probably pretty evident to you. Ben has has touched on it several times um, in studies and up here from the pulpit. But in the world today, there are an infinite amount of issues that cause problems for the church. There are political issues. There are familial issues. There are sin issues. There are all kinds of things where the world is trying to work its way into these walls and infect all of us and everything that we are. But the world is not the greatest threat to the church. We see in multiple times throughout the Gospels where Jesus says, you do not have to fear fear the world because I have overcome the world. He says all of these things, and he also says in the book of Matthew that I will build my church. And I'm sorry, but no matter how strong a worldly government may become, no matter how effective they are with their with their uh, campaigns and their policies and their laws, when Christ says, I'm going to build something, it's going to get built. When Christ says that I am going to keep these doors open until the minute I decide to shut them, they will stay open. The outside world has already been defeated. It has already been overcome. It has already been prepared for by the beauty of God's word. They are not the greatest threat. The greatest threat to the church starts in this room, you and me. You see church after church, pastor after pastor. If you pay attention to what's going on in all these different denominations today, the reason why that church is crumbling, the reason why pastors burn out, the reason why there are congregations that do not get involved and do not pour into the church and the community is because on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, they are coming to church simply because it's the thing to do. And checking a box. Love is left in the dust because we do not understand it and we do not apply it. You need to understand that if you are sitting in church, Not only are you a source of blessing when you allow God to get a hold of you and to transform you and to be an arbiter of the gospel, you also have the potential to cause a ripple effect of destruction that the outside world just can't match. If you don't believe me, I'm going to show you a few things here. I'm going to read you some statistics over several different studies that have uh, been done over the years. And uh, one of the things that we see is that when the church falters, when the church fails from the inside, even, not only is the church affected, obviously, but um, the overall health of the community is too. To give you a kind of idea of where the church stands right now, when churchgoers were asked here in the United States, uh, especially adults, they were asked, 
Do you believe that the Bible, like all sacred texts, contain helpful accounts and ancient myths, but the Bible is not liter literally true? As of last year, there are 53% of the church believe that this book is not true. 53%. That means that it, statistically, if I drew a line down the middle of this room, there's a nice handy one right here already. Statistically, in most churches today, half of that, they do not even believe that this is the word of God. What do you think that does to the next generation? Okay, next one. When they were asked, do you believe that everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God? 61% agreed and threw out the idea of original sin. Again, the statement is asked, do you believe that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism? 56% believe that. And now for the first time in history that we've been studying these things, 51% of the church as of last year believe that no matter what happens, everybody will end up in heaven. Now let's focus in on the family. Because again, family is really the lifeblood of the church. It, when you have a mother and a father, when you have a husband and a wife, and when you have a family that is growing and, and being founded in the church, that is a reflection of, God, of Christ's love for his bride, the church. And so it is incredibly important to be able to have healthy family. Now, we also know from these studies that statistically, if a mother goes to church and the father does not, only 1 in 50 children will become regular attenders of church. 1 in 50. Again, when both parents are neglecting church, that number skyrockets to a massive 80 to 85%. We also see one of the roots of the problem is that only... Um, only 30% of American marriages are based on the standards of, of any religion, let alone the Bible. If you're talking about the Bible itself, it's about 15%. 30% of Americans, um, only 30% based on marriage. 60% agree that people will end up in heaven, that, that family is secondary, and that Christ is who you make of him. And 52% believe that if we live good lives, we do the right thing, that we can earn our salvation. Those, although they originate in the world a lot of ways, and obviously the secular culture that is, that is surrounding us believe these things, it is because we have let it into these walls. And decade after decade, we have raised kids and we have raised parents to believe these things. So when you look out at the church in the United States, it is not because the culture won. It is not because the world was stronger. It's because now, because we have deviated and strayed off like the Israelites of the Old Testament, now God is, is judging and disciplining the church. And as we're going to see in our last passage, it is time for the church to wake up. And that awakening doesn't happen with these big revivals that you see pop up every once in a while and then peter out after about six months. No. It doesn't happen within these walls when you're here on Sunday or Wednesday or at, a, at an event. No, it happens when you go home. It happens when you are in your heart focused on Christ. And so the first point about love that we are going to be looking at is, um, or we already saw, that there is a need for true love. But what does that definition mean? What is love? Now, again, our culture and our world gives all kinds of definitions, and basically, if there are 50 people in the room, there are 50 different definitions of what love is. Okay, so we need something concrete to hold on to, and even in the Bible, there are four different types of love that are talked about, and we're going to be focusing on the one that is agape love often translated as unconditional love or sacrificial love. If you like the old King James, it's translated as charity. And so we're going to see what God's word 
paints what it does when it paints a picture of what this love is. So go with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John 4.16 is where we're going to be. 1 John. First John four sixteen. I'm going to back up to verse thirteen to give us a little bit of context. In verse thirteen, it says, "By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world." Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So, we see a very close relationship between this idea of receiving God's love, and then that output, once you get the input. The output is to abide in Christ. What does that mean? Well, it's an idea to take up a permanent residence in a certain location, which means that your whole life, if you, are a, if you really believe that you are abiding in Christ, your whole day, every single day, should revolve around him. Everything. And so before we move on any further, I want to pose a question to you, a rhetorical question that I want you to really chew on as we go through these verses. And the question is, why are you here? Honestly, be honest with yourself and answer that question. Why do you come here? Why do you take time out of your week to be a part of church? Because I guarantee you, if you're just coming to check a box, if you're just coming to just show up, it's because, well, it's tradition, it's what I was brought up to do. I'm sorry, but you're not abiding in Christ. We so often treat church as the big game each week. We have to build ourselves up and get ready, and then we go in, and you know what, I, I was a good Christian this week, I made it to church, awesome, ready to go, see you next week. No. This is the sideline. This is the bench. This is where you're taking a break. You're getting your strength back. You're getting poured into. But the problem is that all of us have been trained to be consumers. And that has, been, that has worked its way. We have carried that. Instead of leaving it at the door, that idea of being a consumer and a consumer alone has worked its way into the church. And now we come to church and we think that this is about us. It's not about us. It's not about you, it's not about me. When we come to church, when we are part of the ministry, when we're listening to preaching or teaching, this is about Christ and Christ alone. This building, long after it crumbles into dust, the church will survive. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul says very clearly that do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That is why the building, the organization, the ministry of the local church has been corrupted is because when we go home, the real church has already been, has already been corrupted by sin. You've already let it in. I've already let it in. I carry that in, and I expect to God when I come in to feel great when I walk out the door and for all my problems to be fixed. And you know what? I get a pat on the back, and God says, you're doing great, kid. Keep up the good work. And whereas the love of God is poured onto us, especially in the darkest of valleys, you have to remember that you have been bought for a price and for a purpose, and your life is no longer about you. Every single one of us that knows Christ here this morning tried to do things our way, and we all know it didn't work out very well. You are not your own. You are not, you are not just a part of a body or a part of a community. No, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it's time for the church to act like it. We come in, and, and, and with kids in, in ministry, we would call um, these name tag Christians. That when they show up on a Sunday morning, they take the name tag before they get inside the door, they slap it on, and it says, hey, my name is Christian. 
And then the minute that we leave, we take that sticker off and we're back to our old habits. So I challenge you that you need to first understand what the definition of love is. And it boils down to the fact of realizing that you belong to a king. You have been paid for with the highest of price. You have been given a purpose that is higher than anything else in creation. And that purpose is to glorify your king, is to glorify your God with everything that you do, whether you eat, sleep, drink, right? Do all for the glory of God. That is your purpose. The world has such a hard time answering that question, and God lays it out beautifully and then pounds it into our head from, from page one to the very last pages of Revelation. So that is our definition of love, to be consumed by the glory of God. That's where it starts. Before you ever even step out to try to minister to another person, you need to get this right. You need to have a relationship with God. You need to have a growing relationship with Christ. And the Holy Spirit needs to be a constant companion in your day. So we have the need for love. We have the definition of love. And now we're going to look at the effects of love or the lack thereof like we saw with our statistics earlier. We're going to stay in 1 John. And we're going to, actually no, we're going to skip, we're going to flip these. Go with me to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. Making you guys jump all over the place this morning. Now, the book of Ezekiel is um, a mixture of, of prophecy and symbolism and, and all kinds of really wonderful, beautiful things. But to show this kind of idea of the effects of what love really does, I'm going to show you one of my favorite um, pictures that we have. And that is Ezekiel chapter 36. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 36. While you get there, um, Ezekiel at this point is God is, is pouring into him all of these prophecies, all of these things, these warnings, these encouragements, and also gives us a peek behind the curtain of what happens in the life of a person that, that Christ gets a hold of. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, once you get there. Chapter 36, verse 26. Now, when God approaches the unbeliever, unlike what the common belief is, you are born with sin, you are fallen and in love with sin, and before Christ gets a hold of you, sin is your God. It's very clear in Scripture, very easy, and that you are, as Paul says, dead to sin. Okay? Now, when God, just like when Christ called Lazarus out of the tomb, there needs to be some work done before a dead body becomes a living body. And there's a lot of good illustrations in the book of Ezekiel. Some are very vivid, but this one is very, very pretty. So verse 26, God says that, um, yeah, 36 verse 26. Um, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So, and he does this through the power of his word. If you um, go back and you read the, the, um, the creation account, when you, when you look at how God created the entirety of the universe, as you probably remember from your own studies or from Sunday school when you were a kid, whatever the case may be, we see that God speaks things into existence, right? He speaks the stars. He speaks the planets. He speaks the laws of physics. All of the, everything that fills our wonderful planet, he speaks them into existence, until he comes up and gets ready to create man and woman. It is the only point of creation that God used his hands to create. Okay? And he continues to do that. We've seen in the book of Psalms that the psalmist writes that you knit me together in my mother's womb. It is an intimate relationship that not only does he give us physical life, but when we are fallen and dead to our sin, he gives us a new heart beating for him. And he does that just like he did in the beginning. He does that with his word. Um, just as a side note, we're not going to turn to this, but just as a side note, the book of 2 Timothy, verses, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, says all scripture is inspired by God 
In the Greek, the word for inspiration there is theopanoustos, and it means God breathed. So connecting all of that, the only way that a dead sinner becomes a alive believer is through the word of God. Period. It doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are. It doesn't matter how strong of a relationship you have with somebody. It doesn't matter how much time you spend with somebody. The only thing that can save a person is the word of God, unadulterated, with the tap wide open, and it will create a brand new heart inside of a person. So, in order for you to be able to help with that process, you need to know what the word says. Okay? You need to know. And when all of that comes together, and when God reaches down and pulls us out of the dirt of sin, he changes not only our life and our practices, but it changes our very being. Paul says that you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You are brand new. Stuck inside the old body, granted, but you are a new being on the inside. So the first thing that love affects is that it changes our being. The second is that it changes our perspective. It changes our perspective. Now, before we know Christ, and again, every believer struggles with this even after they are saved, we are very egocentric. We think about ourselves and we think about our worldly needs all the time. It, it takes up the majority of our day, and so it's all about our ego, ourselves. Whereas when we are saved, and you read some of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament, one of my favorites, we're gonna, I'll let you turn to Psalm 42. You'll know it when you see it. Um, it changes the way that you view everything. John Calvin, the church father and the reformer, uh, has a very famous quote where he says, the human heart is a factory of idols. It's very true. And that's especially true when we're unsaved, but it is very true also when we are saved. We elevate things higher than Christ, and sometimes they're good things. It could be your wife, it can be your kids, it can be your job, it can be um, your reputation, things that aren't necessarily inherently bad. But once they become elevated higher than Christ himself, it becomes an idol. And idolatry is a cancer that will infect everything it touches, and you need to understand that. Is that if God is not the number one of your life, and he's not the center of everything that you do, you are and I am practicing idolatry. And if you want to know how God feels about adultery, the whole Old Testament lays it out pretty vividly about what God thinks about adult, or adultery and idolatry, kind of the same thing. Um, so Psalm 42, probably help if I turned there too. Psalm 42, and we're going to be looking at verse 1. Again, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, psalm. And we see this, this um, perspective shift. In verse 1 it says, As the deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants after you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember. As I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. And he just keeps going. It's a beautiful psalm altogether. But that shows the difference is that um, it's very easy for us. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning is that if you go too long without eating, you have an alarm clock built into your body, right? You, you start to feel hungry. You start to hear your stomach growl. When you get thirsty, you start to get cotton mouth. You might get drowsy and weak. All of these things are built into your physical body to remind you what you need on a daily basis in order to survive. And Jesus, not only is it in the book of Deuteronomy, but Jesus brings this up again in his ministry in the book of Matthew where he says that man cannot live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That should be your diet. And if you, that's the whole reason why fasting is a thing, is to take something that you have turned into, a, that you 
do need physically, but you've turned it into an idol, and then you train your body and your mind that every time when you fast from food, for example, every time your stomach grumbles, you turn to God's word. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good of doctors that you have, your body will eventually fail. It will. Your spirit will not. You are an eternal being in one destination or another. And if your diet is the constant understanding and application of God's word, you will have life eternal in his presence. And you start to see the world in different ways. You start to see it with the eyes of his compassion, his anger, his love, all of these beautiful attributes that are um, unveiled in scripture start to change how you see the world. And you will not only be effective in your church and in your community, but you will be effective, more importantly, in your home. And the ripple effect that you have will far outreach your earthly physical life. So we have the effects of love being. It changes our being. It changes our perspective. Finally, it changes our actions. Back to 1 John. First John chapter 4, right where we were. First John chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. So we're going a little bit farther than where we were before. I'll back up to 18 to kind of connect the dots here. Verse 18 says that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Remember that. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who has not love, his, who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Okay, so the idea of love is central. Not only to the person and... Uh, and uh, purpose of God himself, but also us. I'm going to give you another little cross-reference. You don't have to turn to this, but if you're a note-taker, you might want it for a, for a cross-reference. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And what I find beautiful about that passage is that the word for power there, and this pops up in the, in the New Testament all the time. But the, power, the word for power there is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite from. And the idea behind that is that when love is placed into the heart of an earthly person, a sinful person, it goes off like a bomb. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been a few Fourth of Julys that I can remember where one of my cousins or one of my distant uh, uncles or family members shows up to Fourth of July with a big bag full of stuff from the um, firework stand, but also with some homemade TNT. And I don't know if you've ever been close to even a quarter stick of TNT going off. It's kind of hard to miss. And I want you to put that in terms of now your faith, your walk, your life, and your ministry. When you walk into a room, and the word of God bubbles out of your life, and you start speaking out who Christ is and why you love him, we should not be easily, easily ignored. It should go off like a bomb in every room that we come into. Our life should be absolutely fundamentally affected by the gospel. That is the goal. And it and it's, is central to, our, to, again, this relationship of love between us and God. So we have a change in being, we have a change in perspective, we have a change in our actions. Now, with this love and with this gift, not only is, does it come with a promise that God will always love you, you are in his hand, it can, you cannot be snatched from him. But 
It also comes with a warning, and that's going to be our last passage today. Turn to me to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I was, uh, a few weeks ago, I was out on a job helping um, a guy fix up his uh, computer and kind of figuring things out, and we started a conversation, and I love having the opportunity to be able to talk church and and uh, open up about the gospel, and he was talking, he was an elderly guy, and he says, you know, it's really sad to see the um, the church, he's, he'd been going to church since he was three years old, and he was in his 80s, um, and uh, he said, it's sad to see how quiet churches are now. It's sad to see so many pastors burn out. It's sad to see that we're losing so many pastors that the Bible college just cannot produce enough. It's so sad to see so many churches dead. And, you know, I, I said, well, why do you think that that happens? And he, he said, well, you know, it's the, it's the, the current government. It's, it's people breaking into the church. It's all these different corruptions. And like I said before, those are all important, and those are all definitely a danger that require our attention. But if you want to know why churches are dead, it's because their preachers are dead. If you want to know why they don't have an impact in their communities, it's because their congregants do not have an impact in their community, let alone their home. Because you and me, we love when we're in a safe space, when we're around people that we know that we agree with, generally speaking, we can talk about this stuff all day long. But then when we go out into the world and it's going to be a little bit awkward, might even burn a couple bridges with a, with a relationship, we get real scared. And in that, in that original passage that we saw in Matthew of Jesus talking, he calls people like that. He calls you and me. When we act like that, it's called a hypocrite. And whereas that, that word has a lot of connotation nowadays, we know what a hypocrite, hypocrite is. Back then, it wasn't a theological term. Paul stole that from the world. And the reason why he did that is because a hypocrite back then, the word is Hippocrates, is, was an actor. And when they would put on these plays, it was a big deal. Plays were all, like, they were a central piece of Roman culture. And because they were so big, actors were incredibly in high demand. And most of the time when they would put on a play, there wasn't enough actors to fit all of the roles. And so you would have an actor that would come out on the stage, play a part, wearing a mask, and they would go off stage, switch masks, come back out on the stage, and continue another person's part. And so when Jesus and when Paul pull this word from the world, he says that is what the believer does when they show up to church, put on the mask of a Christian, go to their work or go to their home, and take that mask off and put on a new one. That is what we do. We are literally two-faced. So protect yourself from that. And we're going to see the effects, an example of the effects of what happens when hypocrisy works its way into the life of the believer. So in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and we're only going to go to verse 7 here. This is a letter from Jesus to the Ephesian church the same Ephesian church the book of Ephesians is written to. Um, now, whether or not these letters were actually letters that were actually circulated in, in real life is uh, a big point of debate. I lean towards the fact that these were real churches. These were real letters from Jesus to actual people. Um, but regardless, the message still remains the same. In verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, and I have, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, 
I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, I want you to, re to remember what this church is, the church of Ephesus. It is founded by Paul. It is the mother church of just about any notable church in Asia Minor, that whole area. Every other church that we, that we see a letter from in the book of Revelation was founded by Ephesus. They had Paul as a pastor. They had John as a pastor. They had Timothy as a pastor. They had some of the greatest names in the early first century as their pastor. This was written in about 99 AD. The church was founded somewhere in probably the 40s or 50s. And so it's not that old of a church, but already being given some of the greatest doctrine and greatest teaching and preaching in history, they have left their first love. I cannot imagine being a church with this level of influence. And the messenger comes in. He says, hey, we have a letter from Pastor John, and John at this point was on exile. He died in exile on the island of Patmos. And so he's writing a letter to these churches from Christ. He's like, hey, I have a letter from Pastor John. How excited they must have been. How encouraging it must have been to say, hey, I know your works, your toil and patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who have called themselves apostles. How encouraging that must have been. And then for Jesus to come and cut straight into the heart and says, but I don't know you anymore. In my time as a pastor, I did a lot of marriage counseling. A lot of marriage counseling. And unfortunately, there was a lot of, of marriages that had gotten into the routine of what marriage is. There's no real love there. Um, and again, we kind of like to think that love is about emotion. The idea of falling in love, you see this a lot with youth kids, my goodness, um, all the time. But that's not what God's love is. It's not something accidental that you fall into. People accidentally fall in love all the time with terrible people. No, this is a choice. And just like an earthly marriage is predicated on the idea of two people being united by Christ, getting up every day and say, I am going to love you today, even if I might not like you today. I'm going to love you because not of who you are, but because, not because who you are, but oftentimes in spite of who you are. And so many marriages today, and this is evident by the divorce rate, this is evident by broken homes and um, how kids are taught love from the home, is that it's just a routine. People are playing house. Like you see little kids when they're kind of figuring out these different ideas, they're playing pretend, and they, you'll have a bunch of kids play house, one mom, one dad, all the kids, all these things. That's the same thing that we do. And not only do we do that at home when we get lazy, but we also do it when we come to church. And that is what God, what Christ is saying is that you are playing house. You're playing Christian. You know better. He says, remember the first things when you, when you and I stood across from each other, we made the marriage vows and said, I will love you for all time, for better or for worse, through good times and in bad with love and forgiveness and peace. And Jesus is saying, I'm holding up my side of the bargain. I'm still here as your husband. I am in here forever, but where are you? It's important that we understand the importance of love. It's important that we understand how important it is to stay ahead of the curves of sin, to see sin with a hatred that God does, and that we see it as the cancer that it is. And that not only is sin a cancer, but everybody who is a believer and that has the Bible not only knows what that cancer is, but has the cure. I cannot even begin to fathom if I had the cure to cancer. Everybody in this room has been affected by cancer one way or the other. I guarantee it. I cannot imagine having the cure for cancer in my pocket and on my phone and walking up to a person and not having the conversation say, hey, you really need to take this because the conversation might be awkward. And that would be just to save the body. And I would do it in a heartbeat. 
Even with strangers, even with my worst enemy, I wouldn't wish cancer on them. I would give them the cure. And yet when it comes to the cure for spiritual cancer, we get gun shy. That's not love. We can do better, and we need to be better. One of the things that drew me into this church um, over the last couple of years is not all of the ministries that are wonderfully ran and wonderfully prepared and wonderfully taken care of. It's not the songs. It's not necessarily the preaching. It's not necessarily the teaching, although all of those I've been fed by and edified by and blessed by. What drew me to this church was that whether it be in ministry or preaching and teaching or in song or watching all of you interact with each other is that not only do you love each other, but there is an inherent love for Christ in everything that this church does. But I can warn you, I've been in a lot of different churches in my life. Several of them, I came to them that felt the exact same way. And over the years, the preaching or the teaching or the worship or the, the ministries got lazy. And when the next generation came up, they weren't prepared for the storm in the world. So they died. I love this church. I adore being here. But I'm telling you that based on Scripture, you need to constantly be looking inward, constantly be looking in the mirror, finding where sin is in your and my life, holding each other accountable, and repenting. You should be coming to church every single week and be feeling conviction. And as long as there is conviction in the church, I can guarantee you the Holy Spirit is there too. So listen, do something. And allow the love of Christ to permeate every part of your being and to transform you so that when you walk into a room, the gospel goes off like a stick of dynamite. Pray with me. Oh, Father, I am I'm humbled by your grace. I'm humbled by your mercy. I'm humbled by your love. We remember the words of the old and famous hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And as we go out into the world, as we take our breather this Sunday morning, prepare to go forward with our week, to step off of the bench and, and move out into where we are needed, that we look at the fallenness and brokenness of this world, we look at people who are lost and dead in their sin, living in darkness, and to remember that there, but by the grace of God, go I. So, Father, I ask that we carry this love, we carry this grace, we carry this mercy and peace, this message that can cure the spiritual cancer of sin, and that we're able to give it to those who need it. That we're not just playing house, we're not just slapping on the name tag of Christian, that we're not just switching through masks, but that when we walk out into the world and we speak, the people hear you. When they look upon our lives, they see you. When they hear us sing, they, see, they hear your glory, and that our lives are eclipsed by you. And that someday when we're called home, we hear those wonderful words, well done good and faithful slave. I thank you for the time that you have given us, that you have built a hedge of protection around us and about this church and the, and the promise that you will continue to build your church. So help us to be your church, not only today, but in the future. And that we live a life that is worthy of the calling that you have given us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name for his sake. We glorify you in it. Amen.